so good morning, everybody. Um, you know, welcome to, I, or to ASAB 2020. Are we in 2020? Yep. <laughs> um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Bob Wong from Monash University, where he holds a prestigious ARC Future Fellow. Um, Professor Wong did his PhD at the Australian National University. Uh, followed by postdocs at Boston University and the University of Helsinki. He's also chair of the International Society for Behavioral Ecology 2022 Congress. So as many of you will be aware that Congress was meant to happen in Melbourne this year, but has sadly been postponed. So let's take a moment to all cross our fingers that by 2022 we'll be able to meet together in person uh, again. One of the things I really like about being asked to introduce speakers is that you get this amazing opportunity to low-key Google stock people whose work you respect. And so having that opportunity to go through Bob's body of work has been absolutely inspiring to me as a scientist. He works on a tremendous diversity of organisms, everything from fish to lizards to birds to spiders, although I suspect that fish might still be his first love. Um, his work encompasses the evolution of animal mating systems, uh, animal behavior, and he's interested in how um, investment in sex influences reproductive strategies. So there's a huge and interesting um, body of work there. In more recent years, Bob seems to have been studying, looking increasingly at the interesting and really important questions of how human disturbances and human actions are influencing behavior, uh, including things like work on how antidepressants are affecting um, the behavior of fish populations. So super exciting and very interesting work. Uh, he also has one of the nicest academic websites I've ever seen, and I strongly encourage all of you to go have a look at it at the break. It's um, not only full of very interesting information, but it's also beautiful. Um, so without any saying anything else, um, I just, I'd just like to hand it over to Professor Wong. I'm really excited to hear your talk. So. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks for a fantastic uh, introduction. I'll just share my screen. Oh, uh, it says that hosts disabled attendee screen sharing. So it's all good. Try it now. Okay, fantastic. It's working. Okay. Right, so hopefully you can all see that. Right, so um, thank you again. It's, I know it's a cliche, but it is really a, a great honour to be invited to, uh, to deliver a plenary. And more so when it's an ASAB uh, conference, uh, especially given that for me, uh, ASAB was the very first conference I attended as a, uh, as a PhD uh, student. And uh, many of the friends that I made at that very first conference, and indeed in subsequent uh, conferences as an early career researcher, uh, those friendships have endured to the present day. And indeed, um, some of those people are now occupying uh, council roles uh, in the society. So it's really good to see uh, people's careers advancing in this way. And that's something for, I think, early career researchers to take away that uh, these conferences are so important in terms of networking and you, you do move through as a cohort. I also want to acknowledge and pay my respects to the, uh, in this case, the Bunwarang and the Wurundjeri peoples of the East Kulin Nation, uh, who are the traditional custodians uh, of the lands here in Melbourne, uh, where I'm delivering uh, my plenary lecture today. Um, so the organizers of this conference asked us not just to talk about the science, but also to begin with a little bit of uh, a career uh, background. Uh, so before I launch into Sex in Troubled Waters, I want to start off by uh, showing a picture of uh, myself uh, when I was a toddler, uh, a photo taken by my mum uh, in Singapore, where I was born. It was the first outing uh, to the Singapore Zoo. And I don't want uh, you to be fooled by the look of ambivalence on my face in this photo. Uh, like many of you, uh, I decided to go into biology because of a lifelong passion for the natural world and for animals. And as Tanya mentioned, I have a soft spot for fish. And I've been fortunate through uh, my life that my parents really fostered my hobby interests and allowed me to have lots of aquaria uh, scattered around the home. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that when it came around to choosing potential uh, project for a PhD that I opted to um, use fish as models to uh, explore uh, questions in sexual selection and speciation theory. So during my PhD, I, I studied uh, this particular species, the Pacific blue eye. Now, having done all of my undergrad and honours and PhD at the one institution at the ANU, 
I decided that really I needed to move on somewhere else uh, if I were to further my career in science. So I did two very short uh, postdoctoral stints. The first was at, at Boston University, as Tanya mentioned, uh, with Gil Rosenthal working on um, swordtail fish in Mexico. And after that, I went to an even shorter postdoctoral stint at the University of Helsinki, uh, working on sexual selection and parental care in species of fish that live in the Baltic Sea. Now, all up, I had only 18 months of postdoc, postdoctoral experience before taking up uh, my academic position. And the reason for this was I'd actually returned back to Australia, cut my overseas postdoctoral stints short so that I could take up a three-year postdoctoral position at the University of Melbourne. Uh, but literally two months into that role, uh, a position came up at Monash. I applied and I was fortunate to be offered that position. So I've been at Monash uh, ever since. Now, during the course of my early career, traveling to exotic locations, both in Australia and overseas, to collect my fish for behavioral experiments, uh, I became increasingly aware of the impacts that human-induced environmental change was having on the natural world, and in particular, the aquatic habitats where I was collecting the fish for my research. So here we have an example uh, of one of my field sites in central Australia, where I've been working on Australian desert gobies uh, for the first 10 years of my career at Monash University. And you can see that this location, um, which takes a couple of days to get to, uh, in the middle of the desert, uh, you can see the reach of human activities. Uh, cattle have trampled the margins and caused all kinds of destruction to this particular um, spring habitat. So it has gotten me increasingly interested in trying to understand how anthropogenic activities can impact animal behavior and also what the ecological and evolutionary consequences might be. So as Tanya mentioned, this has become a central focus of research in my in my group in recent years. And today I'll be talking about some of our empirical work trying to understand the effects of pharmaceutical uh, pollutants. Now, organizers of this conference also wanted us to talk about some personal challenges that we faced. And I have this picture of myself and my partner, Nathan, as a marker. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that Nathan is a personal challenge. Rather, uh, I have this photo up here uh, to highlight um, the issues of both race and sexuality have been uh, personal challenges uh, for me, not just in career, but in life. Um, and, uh, and these are really important things. So I have to say for me, um, uh, issues of race has been more of an issue than sexuality, just because race is so much more visible. So thinking back at my career, even as a PhD student, when I was going up to far north Queensland to collect fish for my research back in Canberra, there were incidents, uh, incidences where I have been subject to racist uh, remarks by complete strangers, and there have been times when I felt uh, unsafe um, in the field. And I know that I'm not alone in experiencing this. There's been some recent commentary in uh, high-profile papers about um, uh, minority groups, uh, researchers going out in the field and generally feeling unsafe. But also more recently, even as an established academic, a few years ago, uh, I was invited to uh, participate in a workshop to give a talk uh, to other academics to share my experiences uh, uh, on topics of uh, cross-cultural supervision of grad students. And I had assumed that I was being invited to share my experiences of supervising international PhD students. Uh, but it was only when I uh, arrived at the workshop that I realized that the organizers had made a mistake and they had assumed that I was a recent international recruit uh, to the university and actually wanted me to share my experiences of what it would be like uh, supervising Australian um, students. But on the whole, I have to say, unlike um, some other people that I know, I haven't really faced any major obstructions to career development. And that's not to say that those hurdles aren't always there, and, and they are, and they can be rather subtle. So for me, the realization came um, partway through my PhD on my very first um, international conf conference visit. Uh, and there I met uh, Professor Andy C, who some of you would know is a, is a well-known behavioral ecologist. And I had read many of his papers, but I didn't actually make the connection that he was a scientist of Asian heritage. So meeting him for the first time was such an eye-opener. Um, talking to him, I realized that we had very, uh, a lot of um, similarities in terms of our backgrounds. He was also a migrant, in, that, in this case to the United States. Uh, we were both uh, bilingual. 
So after that, that chance meeting, um, it was the very first time that I realized, even though I had amazing mentors and, and lecturers uh, at uni, it was the very first time that I actually thought to myself that maybe I too can carve out a uh, successful career as a behavioral uh, ecologist. So that issue of visibility is really important. And I've had very similar experiences meeting um, senior behavioral ecologists um, from the LGBTQI community as well. Which leads me to the importance of visibility and representation. And I'm really pleased that ASAB, at the end of my plenary, will be making some really um, important announcements on the inclusion space. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, so I put up here uh, the, uh, the motto and, and the logo from this year's Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras. And I put this up because earlier this year, I was invited uh, as part of the um, Sydney Gay and Le Lesbian Mardi Gras uh, official program to participate in an event that was um, run by the 500 Queer Scientists Initiative, where they basically brought together uh, researchers at different career stages working in STEM, who also happen to be part of the LGBTQI uh, community. Now, this is something that uh, when I was invited, I was very eager and happy to participate in because um, as my career has progressed, I've begun to increasingly recognize the importance um, that uh, my position as a senior academic um, brings in terms of the gravitas in really highlighting issues of visibility and uh, representation. Uh, which leads me to the present day, and this is a photo taken of my uh, research group early last year when we went on a, a lab retreat. And I want to sort of leave, uh, especially the early career researchers, the, the students, um, with, with this particular question. I want you to have a bit of a think about what, is this, what it is that you bring to your roles uh, that no one else can bring. This was actually a question that was posed to me a few years ago when I was tapped on the shoulder to be the deputy head of school um, at Monash, and I was sent off on a bunch of um, leadership courses. And at one leadership boot camp, the facilitator actually asked the question of, of the participants. And I have to admit, at the time, I was completely stumped. Um, I, I felt like such a fraud. I, I didn't actually know what the answer was. And, and in fact, I was thinking, I hope the, the facilitator doesn't actually ask us to share our answers because I didn't have one at the time. And I was thinking that there were so many other people in my department that the Dean of Science could have asked that I thought would have done a better job as deputy head of school. But it wasn't until six months into uh, that role when I was um, sitting in front of the head of department, uh, drawing on my experiences as being the first in family to go to uni uh, trying to explain the difficulties that I had explaining to my dad, whose first uh, language was not uh, English, why I wanted to do biology or choose biology as a career, drawing on those experiences that I realised uh, that the answer to this question was actually a very simple one. The facilitator was trying to get us to uh, think about us bringing the whole of ourselves to the jobs that we do. Uh, that's all of our uh, lived experiences, and uh, including the challenges that we face, because each of those experiences are unique to ourselves. So it's about harness, harnessing all of those experiencing experiences, turning them into assets and opportunities uh, to help us navigate through our careers and hopefully to inspire others. So I'm happy to answer questions about this um, uh, later on during question time, uh, but now let's uh, turn uh, to science and talk about challenges of a different kind. So for many animals, the pursuit of sex can be uh, rather challenging. Um, uh, looking for mates can be uh, time consuming, it can be energetically costly, and for some organisms, it can also be rather dangerous. So using the example of spiders, males obviously of many species have to tread very carefully when approaching females to avoid uh, being eaten before they have the chance uh, to mate. Now, Charles Darwin, The Origin of Species, of course, came up with the concept of natural selection to explain the evolution of traits that are driven by what he described as the struggle to survive. But Darwin recognized that merely surviving wasn't enough and animals also have to reproduce. And he came up with the concept of sexual selection to explain the evolution of traits that are driven not by the struggle to survive, but rather by the struggle to reproduce. And of course, we know nowadays that sexual selection is a potent evolutionary force uh, that's responsible for much of the weird and wonderful diversity of life uh, on Earth, including the, the beautiful plumes and courtship displays of uh, male bird of paradise, 
It's also responsible for the evolution of weapons, such as the antlers that we see in these stags, which males use to fight one another for access to females. It's responsible for the evolution of complex genital traits, uh, such as the infamous uh, horrific uh, spiky penis of the bean weevil. Uh, it's also responsible for a whole range of post copulatory traits too. So here I have an example from work carried out in North America showing that um, paramiscus mice uh, have sperm that will actually gather into bundles to help the sperm move much more quickly through the female reproductive tract uh, in a competition to fertilize uh, the female's eggs. And of course, sexual selection is also responsible for the evolution of sometimes rather bizarre behaviors such as sexual cannibalism that we see in this European uh, praying mantis. Now in species with conventional sex roles, we know that males are typically the more competitive sex. They're the ones that are um, competing vehemently with each other for access to females. And we know that in many of these species, females such as this rifle bird here, uh, tend to be highly discerning when it comes to the choice of potential mating uh, partners. And by being choosy, we also know that uh, females can acquire a whole range of different kinds of benefits. Um, for example, females by being choosy can, uh, uh, can uh, gain material benefits. Uh, for example, access to males who are good fathers, as shown, for instance, in these uh, poison arrow frogs where the males actually look after uh, the developing uh, brood. And then the second category of um, benefits that uh, females can acquire from being choosy are, of course, uh, so-called genetic benefits by mating with males that can uh, develop, uh, deliver good genes or, in the case of Gordian finches, compatible genes. And so it's not hard to imagine that these mechanisms of sexual selection, both mate choice and um, uh, competition, can have profound impacts on both the quality and the quantity of offspring that are subsequently produced. And by influencing these important demographic parameters, uh, the process of sexual selection can have very important population level consequences. And given that species don't exist in a vacuum, uh, they interconnected through complex ecological networks, these processes ultimately can have very important ecological consequences as well. Now, we also know that reproduction is finely attuned to the environments in which they've evolved. So take the example of this uh, display uh, that this male um, bird is using to attract the female. Uh, the sexual display has evolved to maximize signal contrast against uh, the signaling background. So what happens when environments change? So we know the human-induced environmental change has brought about unprecedented uh, changes to environments uh, worldwide. And so an important question to ask is how might these changes affect reproduction, including reproductive behaviours and mechanisms of sexual selection? Now, on the one hand, um, some of these changes might actually be a good thing, and there's a lot of evidence to show that species might be able to exploit these altered conditions. So here we have an example of a bowerbird, uh, which has decorated the court of its bower with all kinds of found uh, objects, including, you can see up the front here, some toys. But of course, not all good news, and there's uh, just as much evidence to suggest that changes to the environment can uh, disrupt reproductive uh, behaviours. So, for example, work carried out by Daryl Gwynn and David Rents, published in the 1980s, um, from their observations in bushland near Dongara, north of Perth, revealed how male jewel beetles had developed this sexual predilection for empty beer bottles that had been strewn in the bush as rubbish. So what was happening here was that um, male beetles were being drawn to the brown shiny surfaces of these beer bottles, which bear a striking resemblance to the brown shiny uh, elytra or the forewings of females. So the beer bottles were acting as a supernormal uh, sexy stimulus. Work in Europe has shown that um, because of global warming, there's now a mismatch between the timing of migration of certain populations of migratory birds to the breeding site and the peak flush of food that are needed to feed uh, the developing offspring. In many parts of the world, as a result of urbanization, the uh, acoustic uh, communications, the calls, the songs of animals uh, that are used to attract mates, uh, such as the advertisement calls of these European tree frogs, are being drowned out as a result of urban noise. And in North America, birds such as this um, cardinal here are nesting in invasive shrubs with very open 
um, branch structures that actually increase the chances of the eggs and nestlings being devoured by brood predators. And as a result, the birds suffer reduced uh, nestling success in what's a classic case of what's known as a, an ecological trap. And my own work when I was a postdoc uh, in the US working on Mexican swordtail fish revealed how chemical pollution of waterways uh, lead to a breakdown in olfactory communication between two different species of swordtail fish, uh, leading to a breakdown in pre-mating reproductive isolation and the formation of hybrids. So in this last example, we actually see how human-induced changes to the environment by disrupting pre-mating reproductive isolation can actually alter the course of evolution itself, bringing uh, previously sympatric species together. So this last example also highlights chemical pollution as being a particularly insidious form of environmental change. And in this regard, um, there's been a lot of concern in recent years over pharmaceutical pollutants in the environment. Now, many of you would appreciate the therapeutic benefits of the medicines that we take or that we give to our pets or our livestock. But what's not very well appreciated is that vast quantities of these drugs can actually make their way into the environment. So the reality is that many of these medicines um, or their metabolites can actually remain biologically active when they're excreted. And most modern wastewater uh, treatment processes, while very good at removing the solids and the nutrients, uh, aren't actually designed to remove um, pharmaceutical uh, pollutants be before they, they're discharged. So as a result, these pharmaceuticals do end up in the environment. And once they're in the environment, they're a cause for concern for several reasons. So first of all, these pharmaceuticals have now become ubiquitous and they're turning up even in the most remote regions on the planet. So paper published a few years ago, for instance, showed the presence of pharmaceuticals in the tissues of fish and invertebrates living adjacent to one of the research stations in Antarctica. A second reason why they're a cause for concern is because many of these drugs can be highly environmentally persistent. So to take the uh, example of Trembolone, which I'll talk about today, a growth promotant, Tremolin has a half-life of some 260 days uh, in the environment. And another reason why they're a cause for concern is because the receptors that are targeted by these drugs um, are evolutionarily conserved. So what that means is that drugs that have been designed for humans or for our animals can also affect non-target wildlife. And these drugs very often have been designed to have effects at very low concentrations. So an example of uh, a rather drastic impact of pharmaceutical pollutants in the environment uh, was shown in a paper published a few years ago showing population collapse of three species of vultures on the subcontinent in Asia as a result of ingestion of uh, veterinary pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceuticals um, by these birds when they were feeding on uh, dead um, livestock carcasses. So that brings me to veterinary pharmaceuticals and uh, a focus in this area has been on Trembolone uh, in our lab, which is a hormonal growth promotant um, that's used to improve meat yields. So banned by the European Union since the 1980s, um, Trembolone is still widely used in many parts of the world, including here in Australia, in parts of Asia and also in the Americas. So to provide some context, in the United States, some 20 million heads of cattle are produced every year, representing some 60 to 90% of the annual uh, beef production. These animals are treated with hormonal growth promotants. And here in Australia, some 40% of the 2.3 million tons of beef cattle that we produce uh, involve uh, uh, animals that have been treated with, um, with hormonal growth promotants. Now, the reason why Trembolone is concerning is because it's a synthetic steroid, a very powerful one that has 15 to 50 times the androgenic and anabolic potency of testosterone. And not surprisingly, it is one of these drugs that's sometimes abused by bodybuilders. Now, in the case of livestock, Trembolone is administered as implants in the form of um, Trembolone acetate, which very quickly um, metabolizes inside the body of the animal into a range of biologically active metabolites, including 17 beta trembolone. And it's these metabolites that end up being excreted um, by the animal and then can make their way in, into the environment via livestock effluent runoff. So not surprisingly, trembolone has been detected in the environment at concentrations up to 162 nanograms per litre. Now, trembolone was the example that I used uh, of a drug that is highly environmentally persistent. Uh, it has a half-life of 260 days. And researchers a few years ago revealed that the reason for this is because trembolone, whilst uh, 
being able to be broken down by light during the day, how she has the unique ability to reform again under the cover of darkness, um, leading uh, scientists to refer to Trembolone as a zombie steroid or vampire steroid. And we know from previous work that exposure to Trembolone can have sublethal effects. So in zebrafish, exposure to Trembolone disturbingly uh, was found to cause complete female to male sex reversal. So as a behavioral ecologist interested in uh, sexual selection, um, and given that we know that sexually selected traits are under hormonal control, uh, I became increasingly interested in how uh, a powerful synthetic steroid, a known endocrine disruptor like Trembolone, how might this affect mechanisms of sexual selection? So we decided to investigate this question using guppies as our model. And the reason for this is because guppies are very well studied in behavioral and evolutionary ecology and their reproductive an antics are well established. So we know the species is sexually dim dimorphic. Males uh, are more colorful than a female. And they sport all different colored uh, spots on their bodies, including orange. Um, we know that females are highly selective when it comes to their mating partners. And one of the uh, traits that they attend to is the amount of orange coloration on the male's flanks. And we know that, um, that uh, the amount of orange on a male uh, is an honest indicator of um, genetic uh, quality. The species is internally fertilized. So males have got a modified fin called a gonopodium, which he uses to um, inseminate uh, the female. And he can achieve copulations in one of two ways. He can either try to uh, solicit copulations from the females by displaying his uh, colorful flank and engaging in a, uh, in a courtship display known as a sigmoid display, or he can try and bypass female choice entirely and uh, attempt to uh, sneak up behind the female and engage in sneak or forced um, copulations, inserting his gonopodium into the female um, surreptitiously. So using the guppy as our model, we were interested in looking at how Trembolone might affect male behaviors in the, in the context of intrasexual competition, courtship and sneaking, and also female behaviors in, in the context of sexual responsiveness and choosiness. So to address these questions, um, I, and by we, I mean my PhD students, uh, we uh, carried out several experiments where we exposed guppies for 21 days to either an environmentally relevant concentration of 17 beta trembolone or to a freshwater control. Now this next diagram shows you the general setup for exposure over these, this 21 day period. So in the case of Trembolone, we have a replicated system where we had stock solution of Trembolone that was dripped into a mixing tank along with fresh water until the desired concentration was reached. This water was then pumped uh, into various tanks housing uh, fish over the 21 day exposure period. And as a control, we had uh, again replicated uh, identical setup uh, but instead of Trembolone, we just had pure fresh water um, going through the, the various tanks housing the fish. Okay, so turning to the methods, firstly for male behaviours, here we conducted sep separate experiments, one to look at intrasexual competition and one to look at courtship and sneaking. So for intrasexual competition, a very simple design, uh, after the 21-day exposure period, we placed um, a control freshwater male or Trembolone exposed male into a tank with a uh, unexposed um, female and we recorded the behaviors of the fish. And for a male courtship and sneaking, we carried out a separate experiment where we placed a single male into a tank with a single female um, and recorded the behavior. So here we see the four different combinations of males and females. We have trials where we had um, a control freshwater male in a tank with a control freshwater female. We had trials where we had trimbalone exposed males in a tank with an exposed female. We had control males in tanks with exposed females and also exposed males in tanks with controlled females. Okay, so turning to the results. First of all, for intrasexual competition, we found that um, exposed males were significantly more aggressive than control males uh, in an intrasexual competition context. So those males engage in significantly more chases and nips. And in the context of courtship and sneaking, um, here we have a graph First of all, for courtship, uh, showing you the different combinations of male-female pairings on the horizontal axis and uh, amount of courtship directed by the male towards the female. And here what we found was that irrespective of the male's own exposure status, so irrespective of whether it was control male or whether it was an exposed male, when those males were paired up with uh, exposed female, they engaged in significantly less courtship 
compared to the trials where we had a control male in a tank with a control female. Now, the reason for this is likely due to a switching in the reproductive um, strategies of those males, uh, because we found that for sneaking behavior, those males actually engaged in significantly more sneak fertilizations, which, as I mentioned, bypasses female mate choice uh, for males uh, of high genetic quality. Okay, so turning now to female behaviors. To address this question, we carried out a single experiment in two parts. So female uh, mate association preferences were assayed over two separate sessions. So I'll just go through the diagram and the setup. So we had an aquarium which was divided into two compartments. The main compartment housed the female uh, and there was a small, uh, smaller compartment housing the stimulus male. The two fish could see each other thanks to a clear partition separating the two compartments. We then looked, uh, we recorded the behaviors of the fish and we then um, uh, assessed the amount of time that the female spent associating in front of the male's compartment. Now, previously, research has shown that association preferences translates into actual uh, mating inten intentions in pacillid fishes. Now, after um, the female was done with the first male, we removed him and we replaced him with a different male. And then over session two, that same female was then tested again with a, a different male. And we did this for control freshwater females. And we also did this for trembolone exposed females. Now, earlier I mentioned that we already know that in guppies, females prefer males with more orange on their bodies and that this is a reflection of male genetic quality. So we were able to deliberately manipulate the attractiveness of the stimulus males that we offered to females. So um, this shows you the different combinations. So um, in some cases, females were exposed to a low orange male in session one, followed by another low orange male in session two. In some cases, females were exposed to a high orange male in session one, followed by a high orange male in session two, and so on and so forth. So turning to the results. So firstly, I'm gonna show you the results for the control uh, freshwater um, females. So on the horizontal axis, we have the different kinds of males that were presented to the females, either low orange, unattractive male, or a high orange, attractive male. In session one, indicated by the uh, dark teal, and in session two, indicated by the aqua. And we have association time on the vertical axis. So the first thing to note is that females, irrespective of um, the males that were presented to them, spend about two thirds of the 15 minute trial um, associating with those males. Now, importantly for this treatment here, we found that when females uh, encountered a high orange or attractive male in session one, when she was subsequently presented with a low orange suitor in session two, um, she uh, significantly decreased uh, her association time with this um, low orange uh, male. Now the next graph I'm gonna show you uh, are the results for the trembolone exposed females and it's on the same scale. And you'll notice first of all, an almost halving of the amount of time the females spend associating with the male. So now roughly about five minutes or one third of the, of the length of the trial. And moreover, the uh, difference that we previously saw for this treatment disappeared in the case of the trembolone exposed females. So to summarize, um, we found that exposure to a synthetic steroid um, did affect both male and female reproductive behaviors, lending support uh, to uh, the idea that pharmaceutical pollutants can alter key mechanisms of sexual selection. So moving forward, uh, members of our group have also been carrying out long-term studies exposing fish to pharmaceutical pollutants. So I mentioned uh, the experiments today uh, uh, that I talked about uh, involve exposing animals to only 21 days uh, uh, to the pharmaceutical pollutant. We've also been carrying out long-term exposures in large pools, uh, exposing guppies now for 15 generations to an antidepressant, fluoxetine. And our plan is to continue doing these experiments for as long as possible, sampling the fish repeatedly over time so we can hopefully track any changes in both uh, male ornaments and also female behaviors. Uh, and ultimately, towards the end of the study, we will return fresh, the fish back to a freshwater environment, to a common garden for a couple of generations, so that we can tease apart whether, the, whether any changes we see are the result of plastic uh, responses or whether they're due to genetic um, changes. So stay tuned for that. 
So with that, I want to um, finish off by thanking um, various collaborators, particularly Michael Bertram and Pat Tompkins, who are the um, PhD students who led the research that I spoke about today. Michael, who's now a postdoc in Sweden, will be talking um, during this conference about some of his other PhD work. I want to thank the ARC for funding and, of course, ASAB. Uh, as Tanya mentioned, um, I'm chairing the ISB Congress. Actually, it was meant to, to be taking place this week. Um, of course, we've had to kick that down the road for a couple of years. So if you haven't done so already, please mark the 11th to the 16th of September 2022 uh, into your diaries. And with that, I guess I'll um, hand over the mic back to Tanya, who will make some announcements about um, an important inclusion initiative that ASAP is engaged in. And then I'm happy to answer questions after that. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Um, we'll take questions in just a minute, but before we do that, we wanted to announce um, what I think is a really exciting initi initiative that uh, ASAB is taking on. We have formed an equity and diversity project. So we pride ourselves on the idea that ASAB is diverse and equitable uh, and an inclusive place, but we are aware that we could do better. And so that is really our goal. Um, we aim to identify and dismantle barriers to inclusivity in animal behavior in Australasia. Um, but to start that, we've realized that we don't really know who we are. <laughs> so our very first step is to send out a survey, um, which will collect some information about who you are uh, and about any barriers that you may have encountered. And we'll use that information to direct the, the work of the, the project. Um, we are committed to publishing, communica communicating our findings with you as well, so that we'll, there'll be feedback. Um, and we are also committed to making real changes to the constitution and conference guidelines um, as informed by what we see and what we hear from you. So um, we're asking that when that survey shows up, and it should be uh, in the next little while, we ask that you please, please fill it out and contribute so that we have good data um, to use as a bouncing off point uh, to go forwards. We're also asking uh, if you're interested to please get involved, get in touch with us. We're super happy to have more people on board, you know, more hands make, makes you know, light work. Um, and also gives us a bigger diversity uh, of ideas and uh, viewpoints. So if you want to be involved, please contact membership, membership at asab.org uh, or any of uh, us directly. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you all. Um, with that, I'm going to switch off to looking, asking for questions. Um, if you can please raise your hand, that would be helpful. Um, I'm gonna see, it's a little bit tricky to see everybody, unfortunately. Uh, if Maybe if uh, you stop sharing the screen, then we can see more. Oh yeah, there we go, there's there. Perfect. a review. Um, so are there any questions? You may have to gesture a little ways because I have to switch through. Oh, okay, Sherry, um, if you can first. Thanks for the great talk, Bob. I was wondering if you could comment on the importance of exposure to these uh, pharmaceutical pollutants early in development versus during adulthood. Yeah, that's a really good question. We didn't look at that for um, the Tremblone experiments that I um, outlined before, and I think that would be a really cool question, um, given that we know that um, exposure to these hormones can also affect things like um, the gonopodium, uh, which the male guppies would use to fertilize um, the females. Um, so previous work has shown that exposure to um, uh, estrogenic endocrine disruptors can actually change the shape of the gonopodium. So the various hooks on the gonopodium are very important to latch onto the, the female during um, transfer of sperm. So I think that's a really important question and something I'm really keen to look at. Um, so we haven't done any of that with fish, um, but I have a PhD student um, now who's been looking and a postdoc looking at um, uh, uh, early exposure of uh, tadpoles to trembolone. And our interest there is to see how exposure as juveniles might affect juvenile behavior and physiology, but if, then of course also carryover effects into adulthood. And I think frogs are particularly interesting for that given their biphasic life cycle. Um, it used to be assumed that um, metamorphosis clears the slate, but of course we know from recent research now that there can be very important carryover effects. So that's something that we're really keen to look at. Um, so that's a really good question, Sherry. So uh, stay tuned for some of those uh, findings when we uncover them. Okay, uh, any other questions? Again, just gesture wildly or use the, uh, the hands up button. Oh, uh, KLB. 
Hi, Bob. That was great. Great, um, great talk. Thank you. Can I ask a horrible question, which is the horrible question, which is, and can I ask a more interesting question? The horrible question is how biologically or ecologically relevant are those dose levels for wild fish? And the more interesting question is what's going on in the brain? Is that, is that affecting the brain directly or um, in males or females? Okay. So, uh, both very important questions. So when we first approached the, the field of um, ecotoxicology, we've obviously come from it from a behavioral ecology perspective. And I have to say, I was really shocked by what was published already out there. Very oftentimes people expose, expose animals to toxicants, including pharmaceuticals, that are sometimes many orders of magnitude higher than what you actually find in the environment. So one very notable point of difference uh, of the work that's come out of our research group is that we've been exposing animals to ecologically relevant concentrations. So uh, the concentrations that we exposed animals to in these experiments were in the nanograms per litre, which is actually what you would find in the environment um, and um, it's by uh, exposing animals to these low ecologically meaningful concentrations that our lab has also uncovered examples of what are known as non-monotonic dose responses and basically these are responses that you see at very low concentrations that you actually wouldn't see at the higher concentration so sometimes it's our lower exposure concentrations that actually have um, uh, an effect rather than, than the, the higher one. Now, your second question relates to mechanisms. We haven't looked at um, uh, the brain in the context of uh, Trembolone. We have done some work with the contraceptive pill um, and have shown that uh, changes in behaviors of the fish seems to be related to uh, changes in, um, in uh, a gene expression in the brain. So we've uh, started to look at, at some of the genetic mechanisms underpinning these changes. We've also um, looked at uh, tissue analysis um, of fish uh, exposed to um, floxetine, the um, antidepressant, to try and get at some of the uh, mechanistic, mechanistic aspects there. But I have to admit, this isn't my forte. Um, I'm very keen to collaborate with people who, uh, who would have speciality in mechanisms. We know, of course, that trying to get at the mechanistic questions is one of the key uh, uh, four Tin Bergen questions. So um, it is something that, that we found a, a little bit challenging, um, trying to understand exactly what um, uh, mechanism might be responsible for some of these changes that we're seeing beyond what's generally known about um, how some of these pharmaceuticals are, um, are known to work. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Oh, hi, Mina. Got it, Bob. Thank you for an absolutely fantastic talk. I really loved, particularly the beginning, um, was just amazing, really inspiring. But um, my question pertains to the science, and I'm curious, you said that um, receptors are highly conserved, and I wonder if you're talking beyond vertebrates, is anything known about the effect on arthropods? I'm thinking a lot of aquatic insects, you know, they've got larval stages that are in the water and then they're eaten hmm. and they bioaccumulate. And I wonder if anything's known at all about that. Yeah, that's a really great question as well. So that's part of my future fellowship is to try and understand um, trophic uh, transfer. Um, so research by a colleague um, at the School of Chemistry uh, has reported something like 70 different pharmaceuticals um, in waterways here in Melbourne. Uh, globally, some 600 different pharmaceuticals have been detected in the environment. Uh, but um, what Erin showed with her, her paper, which was published in Nature Comms, um, showed that they were turning up in water, they were turning up in the tissues of aquatic invertebrates, and they were also turning up in the tissues of riparian spiders. So what's happening there is that as the stream insects emerge, um, these uh, spiders were capturing the prey and, and taking these chemicals. So uh, I have uh, recently finished a, a, a study um, with Chad Johnson, who was here uh, in Australia on sabbatical, specifically looking at fishing spiders. So we're, we're doing some work with those. Um, so yeah, our plan is to, to do some stuff looking at, at how they might move across um, uh, different taxa. There is some evidence to suggest that they do affect, uh, these pharmaceuticals can affect things like molting um, in um, stream invertebrates. There's even evidence to show that um, exposure to some of these pharmaceuticals can also affect things like algal biomass. Um, the exact mechanisms aren't really clear. So they can have effects on uh, multiple um, 
uh, trophic levels and, and, and exactly how and why uh, we're not really quite sure of just yet. So again, I think a, a really fruitful area for future research. Uh, we've got time for one more quick question. There's a quick question for Bob. No, nope. just looking through all the screens here. Oh, hey, Crystal. Hey, Bob, great talk. Um, I just wondered if we used to kind of neutralize at least Trimble or anything like that that does get into the waterways, or is it just about keeping it from getting it into the waterways to begin with? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Sorry, you, you partly cut out during the middle of the question, but I think I got, I got um, all of the question. Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting one. So I think um, I think attacking it from multiple angles. First of all, I think as consumers, we need to be aware that we shouldn't be flushing things down the toilet or even throwing them in the bin. Uh, we should be returning them back to the pharmacy, any unused medication. Um, and then um, secondly, uh, there are uh, treatment processes that can be introduced. They will be expensive, but it is possible to remove. And some parts of the world are a bit more advanced than we are in, in terms of trialing some of these um, technologies. Now, the, the other thing that I didn't mention is that, um, of course, I alluded to, but, and that is that in the wild, you oftentimes get a chemical cocktail. Uh, and I think what would be really interesting to research down the track is how different chemical combinations might interact. Um, where now, well, we're going to be looking at, at some of these chemical mixtures, and we're also interested in looking at how these chemicals might interact with other environmental stresses, such as temperature, and in the case of tadpoles, exposure to ultraviolet um, light, how these things might interact. But I, I think, yeah, so we know when we take medicines that we're sometimes not allowed to take other medicines because of um, antagonistic interactions. So it'd be really cool to try and tease apart how even in, in nature, when these things are released, you know, does exposure to a you know, if there are androgenic EDCs in the water, do they cancel out the estrogenic EDC effects? We don't know. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. And if you'd all join me just in thanking Bob one more time for his amazing talk. It's a bit hard on Zoom, so. <laughs> Feel the little clap icon <laughs> <come> out, thank <laughs> you. Awesome, thanks so much. And I'll, I'll hand back over to Jeff now. All right, everyone, we're going to take our first break uh, and we'll come back at 10 to the hour. So depending on wherever you are. So um, yeah, five minute break, go stretch your legs, get a drink, get a snack, whatever you like. We'll see you soon. <laughs>